May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Amen. Amen. These words bring us together into worship. Now, on this Sunday, some of us may say, what a week. That might be a question mark. That might be an exclamation point. That might just be a dot, dot, dot. Friends, we gather on the threshold of the past week and the coming week. We come to this sanctuary to say this is the time in which we are renewed. We come into the presence of the living Lord, our creator, our savior, and our sustainer. In the words of Psalm 138, we are welcome to worship on this beautiful day. Psalm says, I give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. For though the Lord is high, God regards the lowly, but the haughty God perceives from far away. If you are visiting us this morning, just a warm and gracious welcome to you. We're so glad that you've come into this time and this space and to be part of this body of Christ that is Oxford Presbyterian Church. As we are known and loved by Christ, we'd love to get to know you. And the first way that we'd like to do that is to ask those who are sitting closest to the center aisle to take these blue friendship pads and to put your good name in there. It is a good name. It is a name that God loves and we'd love to know as well. And then pass that down. And then during the passing of the peace, you may greet one another by name. And if that pew, that, on, uh, that friendship pad in the pew has not made its way back to the center by the time of the offering, go ahead and pass it back at that time. We have, we'll have fellowship after worship, just through those doors into the lounge, and we invite you to, to join us for that time as well so that we can share stories about how God has been working in our lives and how we're doing and what we're looking forward to in the week ahead. And on your way through both doors, to Church Street and to the lounge. If you're a visitor, we'd like to make sure that we share one of these welcome folders with you so that you get to know a little bit more about our ministry and mission. I'd like just to acknowledge two um, special folks who are with us this morning, Mark and Barbara Barnes. Thank you, Mark and Barbara, for being here and joining us for worship. Wonderful, wonderful pastors of this congregation and retired um, just a few years ago and visiting us from Louisville. We're so glad you're here. We have two announcements this morning. For our first announcement, I'd like to invite Matt Benzing to share an announcement on Seminary Cinema coming this afternoon. Mark? Matt. <laughs> Matt? Matt. Mark. Mark. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, this afternoon, we're going to be having our second installment in our um, Spirit of Scotland film series over at the Seminary Cinema. Our film this afternoon is going to be The Secret of Kells, a uh, 2010 award-winning animated fantasy. And it concerns a young monk in the Kells Monastery during the Viking invasions of the 9th century. It's done in traditional hand-drawn 2D animation, which... 3D computer-generated animation is great, has its place, but seeing the artistry that goes into this sort of traditional animation, it's, it's just a very gorgeous film to look at. And um, it's about the creation also. It's uh, sort of a fanciful idea about the creation of the Book of Kells, which you may have heard of. It is um, considered to be probably the greatest illuminated manuscript of the Middle Ages and one of the great national treasures of Ireland. Ireland. Lawrence, isn't this spirit of Scotland? It is. Did we goof? Not at all, because oh. the, the, the Book of Kells probably started on Iona. This is correct. Many of the monks who came to Kells did flee from the Viking invasions in Iona. So, good, we're safe. Anyway, this afternoon, uh, at 3.30, we'll have a discussion prior to the movie. At 4 o'clock, we start the screening. Hope to see you all there. Great. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Matt. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, indeed, indeed. God knows our good name, doesn't he? And our next moment for mission is MEF on uh, Pat Gifford on behalf of MEF. Is, is this? Yeah, th there it is. Okay. Um, pictures. Uh, you, you've been seeing pictures. Pictures. Well, here's a picture. This is Mark, <laughs> <laughs> and he's having his picture taken next Saturday, yes. So there are many of you who are, I think, this lady, 
is having her picture taken, Nancy. <laughs> Many of you who are, all of you, I hope, who are new to our congregation have signed up to have your picture taken for our new directory. Um, it is actually an update of our directory, so those of you who are in it, you're fine. But those of you who are new to our congregation, you want a new picture in there, or perhaps uh, you missed getting your picture in last time, please sign up. I'll be in the, the lounge afterwards to sign up in your bulletin. You've got a little um, uh, uh, link, there we go, to sign up. The other thing that you need to know, please, is that when we update this directory, we're updating the information in the directory also. So if you've dropped your landline and just are using your cell phones, um, if you have a new email address, if you've moved, please, please be sure to let Bridget know so that we can get the accurate information into the directory for this next printing. So again, I'll be in the lounge after um, services today and be glad to sign anybody up who hasn't signed up. I think I've got six spots left. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Pat. Now let us turn our hearts and our minds to worship our Lord.
Friends, it is our joy and our delight to welcome and invite all of you into worship this morning. We remember that the gospel tells us that the company that Jesus invited into the presence of worship uh, included fishermen and common folks like you and me. That company included tax collectors, lepers, prostitutes, the sick, those on the margins, on the fringes, the least of these. It is the testimony of the gospel that, in fact, that there is nobody who is outside the welcome and the company of the table of God. And so we confess here at Oxford Presbyterian Church, indeed, that there is nobody outside of God's company in this space. Regardless of your story of origin, regardless of your race or gender identity or sexual identity, uh, regardless of where you come from or who you are, all are welcome in this place. For all, indeed, are welcome in the company of God. And so, friends, at this time, I'd like to invite you to stand as we uh, come together in our call to worship this morning. Beloved, the invitation is given to every person by Jesus Christ. Come to me. Follow me. Be my disciples. We come to this place, to this time, at the invitation of Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ. We accept the invitation to discipleship in the name of Christ. As his disciples, we worship and praise God. In the midst of a world where cruelty abounds, we proclaim the God of compassion. In the midst of despair that threatens to swallow up whole lives, whole peoples, we claim the Holy Spirit of hope. In the midst of indifference and apathy, we proclaim the Lord of love. Come, let us worship together and share our witness of God's living presence in the world. And so, friends, as we worship together, let us sing our first hymn this morning, number 649, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound.
please remain standing and good morning. good morning. Our prayer of confession is a time for each one of us to acknowledge our brokenness, our sin. This is the reality of Apostle Paul acknowledged when he wrote, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. So we come to our prayer of confession because we need to talk about grace. Having just sung about God's amazing grace, please join me in our responsive prayer of confession. O oh Lord, forgive us when we fail to respond to your call with faith. Through the strength of your spirit, we stand in the assurance of your amazing grace. Forgive us when we are shackled by our narrow understandings of discipleship and our clouded sense of private certainty. Through the guidance of your spirit, we are drawn to the light of your illuminating wisdom. Forgive us when we are frightened of the future or pull back from the demand of your calling. Forgive us when we fail, forgive us when we fail to sense your presence in our past, to acknowledge your grace in the present moment and to trust you for our future. Through spirit, we offer ourselves in discipleship. We stand together as your disciples. We sing and renew in your faith. Touch us now with your spirit, Lord. Touch us now with your spirit. Amen. Let us now take a moment for personal prayer and confession. Amen. O oh, holy God, like Isaiah, the prophet, and Simon Peter, the fisherman, we stand in awe of your glory, feeling tremendously small and broken by our sin and the sin of our society. Even so, you touch us with your refining presence, and we are made clean and whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Forgiven in Christ, please greet those around you with the peace of Christ be with you. If your neighbor is someone you have not yet met, please introduce yourself for all are welcome in this place. Have you guys ever been in a 
boats were floating on the boat. And they were fishing. Let me see if they had a line. No, let me see. Come here. Yeah, you see it? Okay, well, let's see you throw your net. Come on, you've got your two legs. Let's do it. And reel it back in. As we hear God's word for us today, please join me in our unison pray for prayer for illumination. Speak with authority in our lives, Christ. Speak to us into what is in us, so that we might be whole. Speak to us with love, with hope, and with strength, so that we might hear you. And know deep inside that we are your people and that you are our God. Amen. In this season of, of empathy, epiphany, our lectionary passages guide us through the earliest days of Jesus' ministry. Today we join Jesus teaching the crowd along the lake of Genesaret, also called the Sea of Galilee. A reading from Luke 5, 1 through 11. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he, sa he had said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled, with, filled both boats so that, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. 
For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Holy wisdom, holy world. Thanks to be God. Thank you, Elsa. Forty miles. The walk between Nazareth and Capernaum is about 40 miles. That's four days of relaxed walking through Cana and other Galilean towns. At the close of our reading last week, Jesus had just been expelled from his hometown by his former neighbors and friends and perhaps even extended family members. And being forced out of Nazareth, Jesus figuratively becomes the scapegoat. Being cast out of his hometown prefigured Jesus' ultimate death on the cross. Elementally, scapegoating is projecting our untransformed pain, exporting our unresolved hurt, casting our unreconciled sin on someone else. Too often I recognize how much I'm like the residents of Nazareth. While daring to worship the ultimate scapegoat, Jesus, my sinful human nature scapegoats others. I've judged others to be unworthy, inferior, unlovable by the God I've made in my own image. If Jesus walked out of Nazareth scapegoated by those who knew him so well, I hope and pray and only imagine that walking over those 40 miles of beautiful Galilean hillsides must have been enough to clear his mind and renew his spirit. Contrast Jesus' reception at his hometown in Nazareth with the report of his teaching at the synagogue in Capernaum after those 40 miles. Verse 32 of chapter 4 reads, They were astounded at his teaching because he spoke with authority. Then reports about him began to spread and reach every place in that region. So in Capernaum, Jesus began to heal. He healed Uh, Many, one of those being Simon's mother-in-law. Not one to stay in one place too long. The Gospel of Luke says that Jesus followed up all those reports by going out. In the King James Version, it's translated that Jesus traveled throughout Galilee. In the New Revised Standard Version, it says that Jesus traveled throughout Judea, which is a much wider territory. Whether it was Galilee or all of Judea, Jesus traveled And then we come to the beginning of our reading in chapter 5 this morning. Jesus returns to Capernaum. Capernaum lies right along the Sea of Galilee, where the image on your bulletin cover was taken just last year. Luke is the only book to call this body of water Lake Gennesaret. Indeed, it is a freshwater lake. It's about the length of the Brookville Reservoir, but it is many times wider than, than Brookville. As students of this text, we don't have any contextual clues about how many days lapsed since Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law and then his return to teach beside the lake. We simply read that he has come back. And he begins teaching. And the crowds come and they grow. And as the crowds grew, Jesus climbed into Simon's boat and continued to teach. And at the end of that teaching, Jesus said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Thank you, Carol, for helping us embody that a moment ago right here. How I wish the original Greek gave us more context. We don't know if Jesus offered this as a casual command or it was, could have been more of a suggestion. Neither do we know the tone of Simon's reply for Luke employs the same Greek word for both Jesus and Simon. In the message, Eugene Peterson renders the Greek in this conversational tone into English. Peterson writes, 
Simon said, Master, we have been fishing hard all night and haven't caught even a minnow. But if you say so, I'll let out the nets. It was no sooner said than done. A large haul of fish, straining the net past capacity. They waved to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled both boats, nearly swamping them with the catch of fish. Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell to his knees and said, Master, leave me. I am a sinner, and I can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. Wow. Here, it seems, we come to the heart of this passage. The essence of this text is that our response to God's loving, transformative presence through a relationship with Jesus Christ often brings us into the most vulnerable places. We may encounter the living God on the road to Damascus or on the streets of Louisville, Kentucky. We may encounter the living God washing dishes after the community meal or waiting in the oncology center. We may encounter the living God pacing outside of labor and delivery or at the bus stop late at night. Wherever and whenever we encounter the living God, Our human response often follows two well-worn paths. Not only these two, but I'd like to lift up two this morning. The first path is that we reject Jesus in our daily lives, and we cast him out from our homes, for his love is simply too threatening for us. Because his love says, let me change you from within. We send Jesus as far away as possible, saying, in essence, I'm staying here and you're not welcome back. Jesus' neighbors in Nazareth chose this first path. The second path is that we encounter the creator of the cosmos, inviting us, you and you and you and me, into a whole new way of being and thinking and acting. And in such moments, our senses can't handle the tension between the universal and the personal. And so we respond by saying, God, this is your space. This is holy. It's not worthy for me to be here, so I'm just going to go. I'm going to go far away. Holy one, you stay right here. This is your space. I'm out of here. Simon Peter wanted to take this second approach. From Moses to Isaiah, from Simon Peter, and perhaps you. The journey of faith is filled with those who tried this second path. The feelings of unworthiness rise within us. And at the moment Jesus first calls us, or at the 77th moment that Jesus calls us, we are invited to respond again, almost for the first time. Some time ago, I read a story shared by Pastor and Catherine Willis Pershey. She shared this story about her childhood. Pershey doesn't remember the physical act of stealing Edward's wallet, but she does remember wanting it. Pershey remembers her heart racing and her cheeks burning as her first grade teacher queried the whole class about the missing wallet which contained exactly one dollar, the cost of a hot lunch in the elementary school cafeteria. Her heart racing and her cheeks burning gave way to a chronic ache that settled into Percy's soul. For two years, through first and second grade, Percy struggled with the shame. Then one night in third grade, Percy couldn't bear, Percy couldn't bear it anymore. She got out of bed and went to her mother. And between between hiccuping sobs, she confessed to stealing Edward's wallet. While recognizing that her daughter had punished herself sufficiently with the shame she carried for two years, Percy's mother suggested a way to apologize to Edward and make reparations. For years, Percy didn't think about this incident until her own daughter's sixth birthday. They had decided that at the sixth birthday, it was time for their daughter to start receiving an allowance. She had wanted to buy a wallet for her daughter. 
But then the day before her daughter's birthday, Percy realized that she had forgotten to purchase that wallet in which she planned to give her daughter that first allowance. A package arrived from Percy's parents that afternoon just before the daughter's birthday. Not surprisingly, that package from grandparents, it carried gifts for their granddaughter. Then, far beyond a coincidence, more of a God incidence, Percy's parents also included two children's wallets that they found in the basement among some of Percy's childhood items. Without recognizing either wallet, Percy, thinking this was a gift from God, selected one, tucked six dollars in it, wrapped it up with a paper and ribbon, and prepared it to give to her daughter. You know what's coming. The next morning, Percy's daughter opened the wallet, explored all the pockets for cards, and pulled out one saying, what's this? As Percy leaned in to read that card that her daughter held, Percy Percy was stunned into silence. E-D-W-A-R-D written in a first grader's handwriting. Edward. As a parent and a pastor, she faced the memory of that act over 30 years earlier. Percy suddenly felt like a first grader, filled with guilt, consumed by shame, and stained by unworthiness. Father Richard Rohr writes, As we continue to focus on our unworthiness and original sin as our only foundation, we will act accordingly. If Christians continue to emphasize retribution and judgment, we will contribute only to more violence and division. We become what we believe ourselves to be. He continues, Yes, I know I am weak and objectively unworthy of God's mercy, but I simultaneously know that I am totally worthy and my worthiness has nothing to do with me. Rohr concludes, When looking at me, Jesus sees God's beloved child. And so Jesus looked at Simon and said, There is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. Catherine Willis Percy looked at her daughter on that daughter's sixth birthday. And she felt again what it was like to be in the presence of Jesus. And she recalled the grace and the love she felt standing with her own mother 30 years earlier. That night, so many years earlier, she threw herself into her mother's arms, which she said felt like the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Hershey writes, My mother's pajamas and her bathrobe were priestly vestments that night. As she listened to my confession, gave me a gentle penance, and offered me sweet words of absolution. Worthy. Totally worthy. Jesus said to Simon, there is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled up their boats up on the beach and left them, nets and all, and followed Jesus. Worthy, totally worthy, you and me today as we answer Jesus' calling. Alleluia. Amen. Let us turn to hymn number 721 and stand together as we are able singing together, Lord, you have come to the lakeshore. We will be singing verses 1 and 3, verses 1 and 3.
Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you are able and turn with me to page 34, 34 of your hymnal. Not hymn 34, but page 34. You'll find those numbers in smaller print on the bottom of the page. Friends, at the beginning of most years, we, began, we begin the year after Christmas with returning to our confessions and our creeds. This is the foundation of who we are as Presbyterians. It is the first part of our constitution in the PCUSA. And we begin this year with the Nicene Creed. We, we planned to begin this in January, but we had a little inclement weather that <laughs> delayed that a little bit. But I, as, as you all turn to page 34, I'd like to share this context. The context of the Nicene Creed that it was written, it was written as the Anglican theologian says N.T. Wright. It was written not as a teaching tool, it was written as a statement of clarification. What he means by that is that 325 years after the birth of Jesus Christ, the church was in some conflict. The church was, had a deep disagreement. Is Jesus Christ human, A, B, divine, or C, both human and divine? This was tearing the church apart. So the emperor Constantine compelled the church leaders to come to the city of Nicaea and compelled them to say what they agreed. N.T. Wright says that the Nicene Creed is not a teaching tool. It is that, that washing of the church's laundry that needed to be freshened up. And he says it's not a teaching tool in the sense that we may take it to be, because we'll see about halfway down in the Nicene Creed, it skips from Jesus' birth immediately to his death and resurrection. The Nicene Creed says nothing of what, what the gospel stories share with us, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, about Jesus' ministry, his teaching, his miracles, and the transformation that came through the lives of the disciples. So as we come to the Nicene Creed, I invite you with your own voice to join the voices of those who over 1,500 years have affirmed a mystery beyond our knowing, a mystery for our believing and affirming with every disciple of Jesus Christ around this world. Let us confess the faith of the Universal Church with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism, forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and for the life of the world to come. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Friends, these historic creeds that we remember remind us of who we are and whose we are. They remind us that we belong to the God who calls us into the boat, and not just the version of ourselves that we might prefer that others see, but the fullness of our being, the dimensions of life that we celebrate that give us joy, and also the realities of life that are messier, our struggles, our concerns, even our pain. 
the good news of our confessions as people of faith is that we can bring all of these things, the full dimensions of our being, into the presence of God. And so it is for this reason that we gather together in places like this, at this time of worship, that we can offer up the prayers of all of these facets of life, our prayers of celebration and our prayers of our concerns this morning. So at this time, I would like to ask the question, for what do we pray this morning? And I would actually like to start. I have a prayer of celebration this morning. Uh, it is a prayer of gratitude uh, for, I'm going to embarrass somebody, I apologize, but uh, Nick Fears uh, and the trustees. Uh, some of you may be aware over the last uh, couple of weeks, my office is being repainted. And uh, uh, some of that happened this weekend. And, and among the things that need to be moved in order for that to happen is that very, very large, very heavy bookshelf. Uh, in that room. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. And so all of my books were removed from that shelf, and that shelf was moved forward uh, over the weekend and repainted. And I walked into my office this morning uh, to discover that not only had my books been put back on the shelf, but they had all been put back in the exact same order and spot <laughs> that I had left them in. All of the commentaries in the exact order, they've been arranged. I mean, it was as if I'd never touched it. And that, that was a gift that I had not anticipated. And so uh, to Nick, to the trustees, uh, thank you all for that. Um, and also for uh, all of the many uh, gifts of this church that often go unseen and seem invisible. Lord, in your grace. Hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Friends, what else uh, do we need to pray for this morning? Yes. We need to share a, a prayer of thank you for all the legal classes that we can turn away to the city and nursing home. Thank you, everyone, for the fun items you gave us at dinner today. And we take two big boxes of prizes over to the nursing home tomorrow. And I'd like to you know some of the things that are in the boxes. 23 old stuffed animals, lotion, keychains, bottle stuff, two bookmarks for the kids, at least, <laughs> pen, pencils, pencil sharpeners, toasters, CDs, and DVDs, funny jewelry, little fast. Thank you so much. Uh, for the generosity of those who helped to support uh, mission and fellowship events such as the bingo night, Lord, in your grace. Hear our prayers. Our prayers. Thank you so much. Mark, I'd like to lift up two uh, congregational concerns. One is for Kent and um, for Kent's parents. Kent will be traveling over the next um, several days to visit his parents. So we pray for, for Jan and Mickey, or Jan and Mickey. And I'd also like to lift up the congregational concerns in our bulletin, um, many, um, including John Curry and Dave Wilson um, and the Derricksons as well. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Uh, for traveling mercies for Kent and for his family, uh, uh, this, it's this coming weekend, is that right, Kent? Uh, tomorrow. Uh, yes. And, uh, and also for the, the prayer concerns uh, uh, here in our congregation and in our church family, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. prayers. Thank you, Pastor Lawrence. Any other prayer concerns? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. For, for healing mercies. For grace, uh, for her continued recovery and, and a quick recovery, too. Lord, in your grace. Hear our prayers. Thank you so much. Oh, Leanne? I'm, I'm sorry, help. For, uh, for Jen Lake uh, helping Cal after a nasty fall, um, and again, for just acts of generosity in our congregation. Lord, in your grace, hear our, hear our prayers. prayers. Thank you, Leanne. 
Friends, is there anything else for which we need to be praying this morning? Okay. Um, friends, as we move into our prayers of the people this morning, I will um, simply lift up one uh, additional prayer. Um, it, it, it has come to my attention that this morning is actually the 29th anniversary of when Nelson Mandela was released from prison um, after a 27-year uh, sentence in South Africa. So uh, he had been sentenced to life imprisonment for plotting to overthrow the government uh, as part of the African National Congress, which stood in opposition to the ruling National Party's apartheid politics. While in prison, he became one of the most influential black leaders in South Africa, and after the apartheid policy was defeated through nonviolent struggle, he became South Africa's first black president, of course. So um, the prayers of the people that I'd like to offer up this morning uh, include some remembrance of this anniversary. So friends, let us join together in prayer. O oh, holy Lord, not many of us are able or would be able to sustain hope in the midst of such horrors as the ones that we have seen in our global history, such as apartheid South Africa. God, we thank you for the witness of people like Nelson Mandela. We thank you for the prophets in our time. We thank you for those pro pro prophetic voices in our history, in our communities, even here in our own congregation, who remind us that hope is a lifeline for those who hang by the threads of injustice. As long as there are people who are sick, as long as there are people who are held in captivity, who are oppressed, who are denied basic human rights, help us all to consider ourselves to be hanging by the same frail threads. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for the many ways that we here at Oxford Presbyterian Church seek to be that good and faithful and at times even prophetic voice through our own mission and ministries. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with us. May he guide us through the wilderness and bring us home rejoicing. We lift these up in the name of this Jesus Christ, who indeed taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we give thanks to God for the prophetic witness that we have seen in our world through the person of Jesus Christ, we offer up some of the, uh, some of the gifts of our own lives in glory and in gratitude to God.
Thank you for your generosity to our congregation's ministry and mission. Each one of our gifts makes an impact upon this community, our nation, and our world. Let us join our hearts in prayer as we dedicate our lives and our offering today. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, bless these gifts of heart and hand, we pray. As we answer your call, may these gifts represent just the beginning of our journey to carry our good news to this world we so love. Amen. Now please stand as the choir sings first, and then our entire congregation, I heard the voice of Jesus say, number eight, 182. Friends in faith, you have heard what is good, and you know it in your heart. So let us go from this place, believing in the power of one disciple of Christ, to do great things in the world. And let us believe when that amazing grace is multiplied in community. With God, all things are possible. Go into the world and be to be a blessing. Friends, as we uh, prepare to go out into the world, I would also like to invite you to go out into the Molyneux Lounge directly <laughs> following worship. Uh, we do have uh, a moment of fellowship, and we would just uh, love to extend the invitation to delight in each other's company uh, with some food and refreshment after worship. Um, and now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>